First of all, I want to announce the winner of the President's Commendation for Student Posters, uh, which is Claire Lally of Royal Holloway, University of London. Stand up, Claire. Where are you? There. Uh, your poster with Cathy Russell, which the title of which Sentence Congruency Constraints on Letter Identification was judged by the committee to be subtle and interesting work transparently presented. So very well done. And then my second um, privilege is, and this is typical, I think, of the society, of the beauty of the society, that we go from celebrating the achievements of somebody at the very beginning of their career to celebrating the achievements of somebody at the top of their game. <laughs> I had time to think about it, you know. <laughs> um, so it is my privilege to introduce Dorothy Bishop to give the 47th Sir Frederick Bartlett lecture. It's a privilege, but it's difficult to know where to start because Dorothy really has so many talents and accomplishments that when I put her name recently into Wikipedia and read the following, for a while I believed it. Dorothy Bishop is an American variety entertainer, singer and comedian <laughs> from New York City who is best known for her musical parodies of Sarah Palin. I thought I've learned something about her. It turns out that in fact, Sarah Palin impressions are not her forte. But she is a writer of humorous crime fiction um, novels, including the latest, The Case of the Disappearing Dongle. Um, she's, as many of you know, a wise and witty and prolific blogger on such a range of topics, as she puts it, everything from technical aspects of statistics to the design of bathroom taps. Um, as DVB, she has 34,000 followers on Twitter. And of course, she's an astute and inspirational figure in the campaign for open science practices. And we're going to be hearing about that, that aspect of the diamond that is Dorothy in her lecture this evening. But I do wish to remind you that her day job is as a professor of um, developmental neuropsychology at the Department of Experimental Psychology in Oxford, and that she's a leading figure in research on language disorders. She's created a number of measures of language impairment and ability, which are now indispensable, both in research and in diagnosis. She's worked on um, the genetics of developmental disorders um, and comparing autism and dyslexia and specific language impairment and showing that they're not completely discrete disorders. Recently, when I turned to the literature on the evolution of language for the first time, I felt that scales fell from my eyes when I came across her work, showing that specific language impairment is not in fact specific to language. It affects other sequential abilities. And in recognition of these many achievements, she's a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences, of the British Academy, and of the Royal Society. But distinguished as she is, Dorothy carries all of these things very lightly. She's warm and friendly and always has an attitude of, we're all in this together. So it's a particular pleasure to welcome her as the 47th Sir Frederick Bartlett Lecture. You do. <laughs> and you're wearing a top that looks like a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bit. Yes, that's all I am. All right, here we go. Thank you. Um, well, it is a huge pleasure to be asked to give the Bartlett Lecture uh, this year. and. I remember being at the EPS when, in the 1970s, I think it was, it was one of the first scientific meetings I ever went to. And I was, at that time, I sort of fell in love with the informality of the society and, and the general friendliness of it. And so it, it's great to now be here standing in front of you at the top of my game, we hope. Um, I am, though, uh, taking a lot of risks here because rather than talking to you about language disorders, which I really do know about, um, I'm going to be talking about this issue about how to relate uh, what has been called the replication crisis to 
studies of human reasoning. And what I, I have subtly changed the title from cognitive bias and irrationality to cognitive constraints. Um, but the idea that we might be able to study things that affect it. But also I'm taking a terrible risk in that I thought I might do some live polling in this particular um, talk. And if you want to join in, you can just go on your phone and all you have to do is type into your browser this VBOX app, vbox.app, with this then nine-digit code, at which point uh, you should then be connected so that when we come on to ask questions, you can respond and we can see the results, ha-ha, live, if this works. This has been a nightmare, and I have to really thank the local organizer for helping set this up. Um, but here's the first question I'm going to ask. Um, so I'm going to try your responses on the idea that if a researcher conducted a study of an intervention for dyslexia with one reading outcome measure, but the result falls just short of significance, so the researcher alters one data point to make it significant. Is this, one, totally ethically acceptable, two, a bit questionable, so on, so on. Down to five, the person should be fired. And if you could, people are starting to respond, we can see on the top of the screen. Um, we'll give you a little bit of time for you to make your responses to that. The code number, oh, it should be coming at the bottom of this, actually, but... Uh, I had it on the slide, but, for, you know, with all the messing about, it's disappeared. I think I may call a halt here, even though not all of you have responded, otherwise we'll be running late. And I'm hoping I can predict the response to this one. Yes, most of you do think this is not a good thing to do. Although you don't think you should actually be fired for it. Interesting. Right. Um, we're going to have another one. Um, this time, the researcher conducts a study of an intervention for dyslexia again, but this time with four reading outcome measures, but only one measure showed significant gains. So the researcher decides not to mention the other three when writing it up. And again, the same five-point scale. Do you think, how acceptable do you think that is? I think we might call a halt there. Interesting. So we've got a bit of a shift here that this is clearly not quite as bad. It's not good, but uh, it's not as bad. So last one. Um, this time, a researcher is writing the introduction to a paper and mentions two studies that support their position, but deliberately omits to mention two that don't. Again, totally ethically acceptable, right down to you should be fired for doing this. Okay, so that's regarded as not quite as bad, and certainly you wouldn't get fired for it. We'll be coming back to these questions in the course of the talk and reflecting on your responses. But first of all, what's the problem? Now, fortunately, Bobby set the scene for me, but not all of you were in her talk, so I'll just briefly say what the problem is. Um, so in 2005, Johnny Anidis, who's an epidemiologist, published this paper with a very provocative title to get everybody going, ooh, why most published research findings are false. And this was a theoretical paper that examined things like publication bias and the possibility of selective reporting of results, uh, but argued that there were so many of these things going on that it was likely that most of what was published was type 1 error. This was then followed up, though, by a more empirical demonstration in the field of biomedicine in, particularly, uh, in particular, there was a pharmaceutical company, Bayer, who did a study on um, studies where they were trying to take drugs where somebody had described a result in a biomedical department and they wanted to build a drug on the back of it. And this cost them a huge amount of money and they were very, very unhappy to find that a lot of the time, about two-thirds of the time, 
they couldn't actually replicate the basic result that had been published in a peer-reviewed journal, often from a top place. There's a wonderful review of this whole literature, not just this study, by this Richard Harris, who wrote this book, Rigor Mortis, which suggested that this, this is pretty endemic. And the pharmaceutical companies, who we tend to think of as evil, were really getting upset because we think they're evil because they make lots of money, but they weren't making money because they were trying to build their results on the back of bad research. Psychology then had an exactly mirror image sort of experience. And already, I think it these two people have mentioned Simmons et al. on false positive psychology, which was a very striking demonstration using simulated data of how you could show almost anything if you're willing to be flexible in how you do your analysis and you drop subjects and you only selectively report things and so on. But then again, we had this um, empirical demonstration from the Open Science Collaboration where people actually took real studies that had been published in reputable journals and try to replicate them. And there's been a lot of debate about what do you mean by replication and how much replication would you expect. But basically, the results were very similar to the uh, pharmaceutical results. So it was about um, just over a third, 30, 40% of studies uh, seemed to, you seem to be able to get the same result. So that does suggest we've got a problem. And in 2015, the Academy of Medical Sciences got together um, and with the... Uh, MRC, BBSRC, and Wellcome Trust, because the funders were getting really quite concerned about these stories coming out, about how research that they had funded was not replicable. Um, and they asked me to chair a meeting that they had, which was a two-day symposium, which was very interesting, and where we wrote a report at the end where we tried to suggest some solutions. We identified, I won't go through all these problems that we uh, talked about that were in the middle here, but we really thought there's two types of things that need to change. From the bottom up, people may need better training in methods, but also there needs to be top-down change from institutions, from publishers, as we've heard um, earlier this afternoon, and uh, we need changes in um, funders as well. So that was where we were in 2015. But what I wanted to argue today is that we might need to do more to understand this by perhaps thinking about why have these problems persisted so long? So I have mentioned to you uh, Johnny and Edie's 2015, all this stuff happening around that time. Um, but actually, these concerns have gone back way, way further back. The more you trace back, you find that not just to the last century, but even before then, there are people writing about some of the problems that are now being talked about, and yet nothing much has changed. Um, and there is a big question as to whether we'll change now, which Bobby would refer to in her talk. Um, I'm going to argue that there are certain ways about how we think that I've called here cognitive constraints um, that I think have to do with why we have so many problems persisting, that it's not easy to do science well, because in some senses it does conflict with the natural way in which we do reasoning. Um, and, of course, I'm not an expert in reasoning, so I've been reading like crazy, and all these people here who know much more about it, it were in the symposium, have been, I've been trying to sort of get up to speed on this to see how plausible this is. But I, so I'll be interested to see what take they have on this. But I think there are these four things that I'm going to focus on, which is confirmation bias, systematic misunderstanding of probability, what I call asymmetric moral judgments, and this is going to relate to those questions you had at the, the start. And also I'm going to bring in Bartlett and talk about schemata and the fact that we have to think in a particular way when we want to remember things and when we want to communicate them that it can be very helpful, but also can be a problem for scientific communication. So the structure of the talk is that I'm going to actually go through this in terms of the different stages of the research process, rather condensed down. Um, but I'll talk about experimental design to start with, um, where I'll talk about confirmation bias and statistical misunderstanding. I'll then say something about things that happen when we're doing data analysis, and then finally come on to the actual process of scientific reporting. At the end, I'll try and say something about solutions, although I think we've still got a long way to go there. But I think that thinking about it this way may help make some solutions seem more plausible than others. Let's start with experimental design and confirmation bias. Now, Ulrika, I've been reading a lot of Ulrika lately because she really knows about this stuff. And I realized that uh, I said, I, when I was planning this um, talk, and I said to David Shanks, I said, I'm going to talk about confirmation bias. He said, well, you know, it's not everything it's cracked up to be. Um, so it clearly is a rather loose term uh, that is used for many phenomena. But if we go back to the really original uh, 
studies of it, we have the dear old Waysen task. Now, the Waysen task, I'm pleased to say, was published in the Quarterly Journal of Experimental Psychology. And it goes back a very long way. And I used to hear about it at e EPS meetings. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's a deceptively simple task. So it's this notion that you can think about hypothesis testing by presenting people with this very simple task. They see these cards, and you say to them, each card has a number on one side, a patch of color on the other. You have to test the hypothesis that for these four cards, if an even number appears on one side, the opposite side is red. And all you have to decide is which cards you would turn over to test the hypothesis. And if you haven't encountered this before, it's worth sitting and just thinking what you think your response would be. Um, in fact, uh, the cards that are vital for testing the hypothesis is number eight, but the brown card. And that surprises people because most people go for the number eight and the red card, which were mentioned in the hypothesis. But the key thing about this, these two cards is that they potentially could disconfirm the hypothesis because if you turned over the brown card and it had an even number on the other side, then it would disconfirm the hypothesis that if an even number appears on one side, the opposite side is red. Now, you might think that's a nice party trick, um, but a survey of 84 scientists by Mahoney in 1976 found that fewer than 10% of them correctly identified the critical cards. And this included physicists, biologists, psychologists, and sociologists, and it didn't make much difference. And um, this was then taken by researchers on reasoning to say, ha-ha, this demonstrates that we have confirmation bias. Uh, because what we're supposed to do as good scientists, if we believe Popper, is to design experiments to look for falsification of our theories. But in practice, we're not doing that. We're looking for confirmation. We think of a result that would be found if the hypothesis were true. And we then look for that result. So I thought, oh, yeah, this is really interesting. And then I went on and read beyond the 1970s and found that everybody had been terribly upset with the Waysen task and this sort of argument. Um, and in particular, uh, Nick Chater had been, I remembered actually attending, I think, a talk by Nick in the EPS years ago, talking about this and saying all of what's wrong with the Waysen task. But one of the problems with it is that it really uh, relies on this idea of, falsifiable, of falsifiability of a hypothesis as if your hypothesis is really deterministic and you can just have one bit of evidence and if that comes up, it disconfirms your theory. Whereas in practice, the sorts of problems that we're dealing with are more like um, probabilistic associations, such as does smoking cause cancer? Most people would say yes, although this is actually R.A. Fisher, the eminent statistician who argued until his dying day that he didn't. Um, but um, the question is, if I say to you, does smoking cause cancer, would your belief in that be affected by seeing people who smoke and don't get cancer? Probably not or people who, don't, who get cancer but don't smoke? Probably not. Um, because we know this is a probabilistic association. And so we're not sort of looking for the killer negative result that's going to rule this out forever. And what people are actually doing is using evidence to select between competing by hypotheses to find one that best fits the data, rather than just sort of looking for the killer disconfirmation. Um, having said that, though, um, I felt, as I thought about this more and more, unhappy with as you're sort of dismissing this as relevant to how we do science. And I think that what I feel has got lost in reevaluating this work and really being fairly dismissive of it is that I feel people who work on reasoning have now got very focused on the question of are people rational or not um, and how they interpret existing evidence. Whereas I think that. To some extent, I don't care whether people are rational or not. What worries me is that people are not necessarily actively seeking out evidence that will potentially be important for their hypothesis one way or another. Um, and so I think it's not that we are passive consumers of evidence that comes in front of us. We have to decide which evidence we attend to. And I think there's a grain of truth in the original task, and I may be, there may be lots of evidence against this, but the reason I think that is because in, in the real world, when people are doing science, you see this all the time, that people just settle on one explanation and don't move forward. This is a, an example that came up recently in my field that is the sort of thing that drives me absolutely nuts. Um, and it's a failure of people with money and uh, policymakers, scientists who use a lot of funds to try and evaluate something 
and ignore the fact that there are better methods for doing it, because obviously those don't come naturally to them. So children who have a few words at age two, we call late talkers, um, Public Health England very, has a very noble ambition of closing the gap between those children and other children. What is their approach? Well, they say these children tend to be lower socioeconomic status. So we're going to look at children who are lower socioeconomic status, give them some intervention, and lo and behold, we're able to show that the percentage of children who are below the expected level has gone down. Hurrah! We've closed the gap. We're going to roll out the program, and it's an expensive program. So I turn up at meetings, I'm asked to comment on this, and I say, mm, this is not actually as safe as you think. There's a decrease in the language problems after intervention, but what you haven't taken into account is the possibility of regression to the mean, the possibility of a placebo effect, and the fact that children often improve over this age range anyway without intervention. And indeed, there have been studies going on for some years showing that if you do a properly controlled study, then the untreated children improve as well. So here are language pathways from a big Australian study between two and four years. And 19% of the population were late talkers. Uh, and they just followed them up. This is without intervention. And they found that about uh, three quarters of them were in the normal range by the age of four with, without you needing to do anything to them. And there have been other studies where they've actually done proper randomized controlled trials of early years intervention. Yet, you know, in a sense, this message is just not getting through to the policymakers. Um, one can think of political reasons why that might be so, but I think it's also just people are very bad. They seem to find something. They observe children getting better, and it doesn't occur to them to look for anything else. And I'm very much persona non grata because I come along and say, hmm. Um, so that's, I've got other examples, and I, I've written this talk up, and I've got other examples of this kind of thing. But I think you know, the fact that it took until 1948 before the randomized controlled trial became standard in medical research is telling us something about how this, this way of thinking about things, it doesn't come naturally to people. Um, but the second problem in experimental design when you're designing your experiments is comes down to this statistical misunderstanding. So well, let's move on to consider that. And some people have already mentioned this afternoon the issue of statistical power and whether it's important or not. And here's a problem um, from Kahneman and Tversky. So we're going way back into the 1970s. Some of you may be familiar with this problem, but uh, bear with me. So it's basically, you've got a town served by two hospitals. In the larger hospital, about 45 babies are born each day. In the smaller hospital, about 15 babies are born each day. In the long run, about 50% of babies are boys. So we're going to have a period of one year. Each hospital records the days on which more than 60% of the babies born were boys. Which hospital do you think recorded more such days? And well, let's have another poll. Small hospital, the large hospital, or would they be about the same? Okay, so um, we've got an answer very similar to that obtained by Kahneman and Tversky, replication, um, which is that most people think they're about the same, but some people are saying the small hospital. Uh, the correct answer, um, oh, is not about the same. <laughs> My red box has somehow magically moved into the wrong place. It's the small hospital. It's the small hospital. Um, because a smaller sample just gives noisier estimates. And the problem is that we're used to sort of thinking large samples, small samples. If you're estimating an average, it doesn't make, a, you know, it will come out about the same, whether it's small or large. But if what you're estimating is the error of measurement or the error in, of estimating that average, um, what you can see here is the small hospital in red, very bouncing up and down day to day in terms of the percentage of, of male births in both directions, whereas the large hospital, it hugs that median much more closely. This is basically just a function of the fact that um, the, the uh, larger hospital, you get a, a bigger sample, and so it's more reliable. And Tversky and Kahneman pointed this out, that there's this belief in the law of small numbers, 
um, as they call it, which is that people just don't appreciate how a very small sample um, is making a huge difference to the accuracy of your estimates. And they say people have these strong intuitions about random sampling, which are wrong in fundamental respects, and they're shared by naive subjects and by trained scientists, and they're applied with unfortunate consequences in the course of scientific inquiry. And in particular, I would argue that this may well be a reason why so many studies are underpowered. People just do not appreciate the relationship between sample size and how accurately they can estimate something and how it's a function of actually the square root of the sample size. Um, and what you find, and again, this is anecdote, but um, people, when, when people go to a statistician and the statistician, they say, I want to, if, they, if you've got a statistician who you can get advice from, and you say to them, I'm planning this study, uh, what sort of sample size should I have? Um, and you tell them, um, I've got a statistician who works with me now who used to work in a medical department where he did have to give this sort of advice. And he said when he told people, they would look at him with shock and horror and then plead with him to come up with a different number. Uh, and then they would get cross and they would go away and say, well, you're just being pedantic. Of course I don't need to do that. So people just don't get it. And that is a big problem. And I'm going to think that the possible way of dealing with this uh, is to get people to simulate data. So I'm very gung-ho for, for training people with uh, simulating data sets so that they can actually see what happens. So this is the sort of thing that I've been using in courses that I run. So I get people to just learn enough R or whatever to simulate data sets from a huge population. So they first of all simulate a huge population where there's a genuine effect size of 0.3, of a difference between the pink group being higher than the blue group and then just pull out samples of 20 for each group and plot them. And you can do a, a t-test as well. And when you do that, you see there's one that's significant, there's one that's significant, and there's one. But that seven of those 10, there's no difference. Some of them look as really similar means. Um, and some even often go in the wrong direction if you've got a small effect size. And when you've done that, you start to appreciate it. Until you do that, just being told by a statistician doesn't seem to cut any ice. And if you have a larger sample, you do better. This is 100 per group, but even then, I mean, this is better powered, but as you can see, six of them actually come out as uh, giving you a significant result. This is assuming we're doing, you know, the sort of standard null, null hypothesis significance testing. So I think statistical misunderstanding is a big problem that we have to grapple with. Um, but it also, in, in another sense, statistical misunderstanding is what I think leads to p-hacking. So there's a much debate as to whether who, people who do p-hacking are just being wicked um, or whether they just don't understand what they're doing. And uh, I, my, my view is that it's very much the latter, that people realize if perhaps that it, they shouldn't be doing it but don't realize uh, what a severe problem it is. Let me just try and illustrate this. Um, this is a little uh, illustration using what's known as the Garden of Forking Paths. That was the title of a short story by Borgeth, which was then picked up by Andrew Gelman, a statistician who was writing about the sort of things like p-hacking and pointing out that what tends to happen when you're um, doing an analysis is that you can take many different routes through that analysis, and what people often do is do so in a way to try and optimize finding a significant effect. So let's suppose I've got a huge sample of kids where I've got data on handedness and whether they've got ADHD or not. And I am terribly interested in an association possibly between these two things. I know that sounds very dull, but it's the sort of thing that turns me on. So um, what I've done is looked for uh, an effect and not found it. But then I've thought, well, if I just focus on young children, it's looking a bit more promising. So I've subdivided my sample into two, um, and I'm looking again here to see what the p-value is. But note, this is what people don't note and don't realize, is that now I'm really looking at whether either one of these or both of them are significant. I'm no longer doing testing a single comparison, really. Um, and so if I had predicted a particular association at this point um, without and, and knew in advance that I wasn't going to look there, that's a very different thing from exploring your data to look at every option. And we can go further. We can say we've got two measures. We've got a measure of skill. We've got a measure of preference. We go down the forking paths. And as you see, the probability of getting at least one of these things on the terminal coming out as less than 0.05 is now higher. And you can keep going. You can divide them into males and females. And you can even say, if I now look at uh, young urban females on the measure of hand skill, I get significant 
p is less than 0.05. Hooray! But of course, it's completely meaningless because the chances of getting at least one of these things at the terminal level uh, to reach that level of significance is now more than 50%. Uh, and it's, the problem is that you're not treating p-values, you're not interpreting them as they were intended to be interpreted if you do this sort of p-hacking. Um, so p-values can really only be interpreted uh, in terms of the context in which they're computed. Um, and there's a huge difference between using uh, uh, probabilities to talk about a specific result that you predicted in advance. But if you did not predict that specific advance, the p-value no longer reflects how unusual that result is. So uh, you need to really change how you compute the probability. You can, in some cases, do a bond for only correction. But the general view is that um, you really need to keep track of all the potential analyses you could have done, rather than just trying to wend away through your data and focus on, on the sole thing that came out uh, to give you this magic p-value. Um, and there's lots of ways you can go astray, much of which was covered in the Simons et al. paper. Um, so I've illustrated post hoc division of your data into subgroups and data dredging from more than one variable. So we have the skill measure and the preference measure, but often people have many measures and just pick the one. Trying various analytic approaches until one works. Um, and things like multi-way ANOVA, most of us are never taught that uh, actually every main effect and interaction that you're looking at uh, you, if you haven't got an a priori hypothesis about which things were going to come out as significant, uh, then you need to also correct for the number of those comparisons that you do. And that's not well appreciated, and it's not mentioned in uh, statistics books. And of course, what people get excited by is that SPSS spits out this ANOVA table with all these things, and then they say, that one, that one there, P less than 0.05, and get all excited. But that is not appropriate. Now, I think, so I think that... This is one reason why people engage in p-hacking, because they really don't understand uh, how easy it is to get type 1 errors. But I think there's also this interesting moral asymmetry, which is why I ask questions about what you thought about the morality of doing it. So here's a study that's similar to the poll I did at the start, where um, members of the public were asked by these psychologists, Pickett and Roche, um, to judge whether about, they were given little scenarios about a scientist who falsified their data and a scientist who selectively reported their data. And they had to judge whether this was morally acceptable, whether they should be fired, whether they should be sent to prison. Um, and <clears throat> they, they had pretty severe judgments. I mean, they did tend to think if you falsified your data, you should be fired. And I think many of us would probably feel it's a pretty serious thing to do, although we might blench a bit at that. But selective reporting was still thought of as bad, but not as bad. So, uh, but although there were, I mean, two thirds of the general public think that if you uh, basically selectively report your data, which is what p-hacking is, you should be fired. That's worth thinking about. Um, okay. Um, and I think though that in general, we tend not to take that so seriously because we see omission as Inf of, of information as dishonest, but more acceptable than lying. So there's a nice study of negotiation uh, done by, uh, in business studies by Rogers et al. So they had a scenario that they presented people with uh, about a, a car salesman. And this car doesn't look like one you'd actually want to buy anyway. But um, they basically sort of said, the car salesman either can just lie to you and say, this, is, this car is a brand new car, it goes brilliantly, or they could omit to mention something terribly relevant about it. And I have to say, I, w I speak as one who nearly once bought a car with a left-hand drive without realizing it, because uh, nobody actually mentioned it. And I didn't actually notice that that's not where the steering wheel usually is. Um, but also, there's this business that you can state something that's true, but in a misleading way. And this is the sort of politician's answer. So the, the, uh, vent the person you're trying to sell the car to says to you, um, well, has it ever broken down? And you said, well, just yesterday it started brilliantly, you know, and you don't actually answer that question. And that's called paltering, which is a lovely word. And the interesting thing was that all of these things are seen as dishonest, but paltering where you say what you say is actually true, but it's missing the question a bit, is seen as slightly less awful. And I think that there's an element of this um, in p-hacking as well. Um, 
So p-hacking doesn't involve changing your data. In fact, it often involves reporting what SPSS or whatever has spat out at you. And if you don't understand probability, it probably seems innocuous anyway. Uh, and uh, Uri Simonson, I think it was, who said that most people regard it as more like jaywalking than burglary. But I think it has this aspect of not overtly doing something wrong, but rather letting something happen, which we seem to be more forgiving about. I'll come back to these, that distinction uh, later when talking about also reporting on the scientific literature, where I think the same distinctions come out again. But um, let's first of all just look at what happens in reading the literature and how confirmation bias of a different kind clicks in, I think, when we're doing that. So I would say that I don't really need to um, labour the point that cherry-picking of evidence is you know, very, very widespread. We're all very familiar with it. That you, I mean, I certainly find myself doing this, that you sort of have a, fir a firm view about something, and then you really try and find evidence that will agree with um, your particular view, and you tend to ignore evidence that doesn't. Um, this is an example of how it pans out in practice in um, re reporting and citation biases in the literature, though. And this makes it clear that this is not a totally innocuous thing to do. But in this study, they were able to look at studies that were and were not published because what they were doing was looking at uh, efficacy of treatments for depression, which had to be registered. So in the medical profession, often now you do have to register your study and say what you intend to do, precisely because they want to be able to pick up missing data. So we started out with about 50-50 in terms of the studies that did and did not show uh, an effect of the intervention. The red ones didn't, and the green ones did. They then underwent publication bias in the sense that about half the studies that, showed an uh, that didn't show an effect never got published. They then described outcome reporting bias, where even though the study didn't find an effect, somehow the authors made it sound as if it did, and then there's spin, which is, and they've got mild spin and spin, which is, I don't know quite what, I can't remember what the distinction was, but people will then sort of make, I suppose, make excuses for the null result or whatever. But then we get to citation bias, and here the size of these circles reflects how many citations each of these studies had. So if you look at the poor old red studies, first of all, they don't get reported, then they get spun, et cetera, et cetera. But if they actually even get published, nobody cites them because they're tiny little red dots with big, big green dots. So we end up with a situation where going from this, which suggests that some of these interventions are 50-50, to looking as if we've got overwhelmingly positive evidence for interventions being effective. So is this a culpable thing to do? Um, I think you know, if you say, well, this, this looks really wicked, but on the other hand, I have to come clean as somebody who has done this myself, and I feel I've done it unwittingly. Um, and it fits with the idea that it's easier to process and remember information that agrees with my, your viewpoint. This gets very meta, actually, because as I review this literature, I find papers that agree with my viewpoint, and I bring them into this talk. I mean, there's sort of no escape from this. But here's an example, a personal example. So again, I'm sorry it's anecdote, but it's, it, it, it hit me between the eyes when I saw myself doing this, and this was a few years ago. I used to give talks about heritability of language disorders, and as, as Celia says, I, I did twin studies and genetic stuff. And in the 1990s, uh, there were three studies published um, which showed this pattern of results where if you take identical monozygotic twins, they were more similar to one another than dizygotic twins. They were all growing up together, uh, in the two twins in the same family. But this difference is very indicative of a strong genetic effect. So I'd give my talk and say, look, we've got three studies showing a strong genetic effect. And what's interesting is that then in 2005, this study appeared that showed nothing like that at all. It showed um, very rather low concordance between twins and not dissimilar between the two types of twin. And I just found that I, I only realized this afterwards when I had to do a review article, and I was checking all the literature rather more carefully. Uh, you know, here was this study. Now, it wasn't that it had just passed me by the first time, because Hayu Thomas was my graduate student. <laughs> Uh, she wasn't actually doing this study with me. She'd gone on to work with Robert Plowman, but I knew all about what, you know, we met and talked about what was going on. So I was aware of this study, but somehow it had sort of absolutely disappeared from my consciousness until I, it was forced upon it. And then, of course, now when I give talks, 
life is more complicated because I have to say, well, we've got all these studies, and then there's this one, and then I have to try and explain why that one got different results. So I think that this can happen without intending to do, to do wrong. And I think that this is one reason why we regard this sort of uh, citation bias as, as relatively acceptable. And uh, most of you, I think, felt it wasn't good in the example that we had at the beginning if somebody didn't cite literature that they actually knew about. But at the same time, you, it, it wasn't nearly as heinous a crime as some of the other things that we were rating. Um, so I think that it's quite interesting to consider why this is so. And one reason is that you might feel it's, it's unintentional and it's hard to demonstrate that it wasn't. There's also that when you're writing an introduction to a paper, you're often having to tell a story and set the scene for your study in quite short space. And you don't really want to go off in digressions about why Hayu Thomas, despite being trained by you, managed to get this awful result. Um, <clears throat> and then there's social pressures. You sense that, well, of course, everybody does this. But I think it's also it's impossible to read everything. Um, the lovely quote from Ecclesiastes it's, uh, I came across, of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. I can agree with that. Um, but there's also the notion that there's no obvious victims. You know, we do this, we all do this, but does it really matter? And of course, the problem is there are victims to this, because there's the general public, um, particularly if you are working in an area such as a medically applied area where you may have patients wanting to use your research or other people using research. But also, you have to think about the researchers who are trying to build on results. And when we had question time after the last uh, symposium or the last uh, session, we um, had questions about what about early career researchers? Are their careers going to be blighted if they don't get positive results and so on? One of the problems often for junior researchers is they get very excited about doing a study because they read one in the literature and they think, this is what I want to build on. Um, and if that isn't solid, um, if it is like those green blobs, it's been sort of massively hyped and selectively reported so that you think you're building on something solid, but actually you're building on sand, then you can waste two or three years thinking that it's your fault that you can't get this result, when in fact it never was a solid result anyway. And I regard that as a really quite serious problem that we have. Uh, and funders, of course, also are very concerned that they don't want to spend a lot of money um, funding research that's built on sand either. So I feel that we do need to address these problems that arise when we have selective citation. Does it really matter? Uh, we're going to do another poll, so if you want to get your phones out. Um, this is, I think, the last one. Um, there's, well, there's two, you know, two together. But I want you just to think about how this plays out and how serious it might be by considering a series of experiments and we're testing the effectiveness of a treatment and if the treatment finds a significant difference uh, you say why and if not you say no, N. Um, we're going to say we've got the Bayesians will love this, you'll all work it out in no time at all. Alpha 0.05, that's the probability of a yes when the treatment uh, has no effect is 0.05 and the probability of not seeing an effect when it has no effect is 0.95, but the power is 0.8. So if the treatment is effective, you should have a 0.8 chance of finding it. And you start by thinking 50-50, the treatment works or not. Now you're going to have a series of results, YN, Y, N, N, Y, and you have to judge whether you think the treatment is very likely to be ineffective, may be effective, but need for more experiments, and nobody's replying, or the treatment is very likely to be effective. Oh, good. Getting to. Stall a bit, so I think. So the majority of you are thinking that it may be effective, uh, but we need more experiments, and or that it's very likely to be ineffective. That's interesting. Um, if you actually do a likelihood ratio here, um, it's actually quite strong evidence. Um, the log odds in favor of that treatment are three, which, so for each time you get a positive one, you can basically say, how likely is that I would have got this if it was true or if it was not true? that there was an effect, and every time you get a negative one, you do the same. And you can actually work up this sort of little diagram and go for each next trial. You see you're building from one to the other, 
and you're actually getting to a position where it's 20 times more likely to be effective than ineffective. And if I got that sum wrong, I'm sure the Bayesians will correct me. Um, but we'd, let's just do one more. So this is the sequence now. Same thing exactly, but we've got a longer sequence. So we've got, again, three positive ones, but this time with uh, more negative ones. Won't wait for all the laggards, but uh, okay. So now people are again tending to sit in the middle, but more likely to think it's ineffective. And indeed, if you again follow that same sort of logic, that for each trial you can the likelihood uh, this is the log odds of the true effect, but the odds goes up or down, um, you can see that you form a very different conclusion, especially if you're a Bayesian where you went up the other way before. But in fact, these are the same sequences, of course, with half the null results not reported. Um, or not cited. So if you're reading an introduction to a paper and they only mention half the results that were actually um, null, you will form the impression that this is a much more effective treatment than if it wasn't. And so this is just a demonstration that in practice these things matter because they can really shift the entire bulk of evidence from positive to negative simply by omitting 50% of the trials that obtained a null result. And this is a, this, uh, the idea of plotting it this way came from this very fine paper by Nissen and colleagues, which is on publication bias and what they call the canonization of false facts. But I would say it applies not also to citation bias. Um, so if you are reading somebody else's literature review and they're omitting a lot of the null literature, you again form the impression of, that you've got a very solid fact. And they talk about canonization is the point to which when you get to a theory where you really stop questioning it, and you don't feel you have to cite all the evidence because it's an accepted thing. And they, they work through this model where a claim may be true or false, and then these beta and alpha are to do with the power and the, and the alpha level. Uh, but you may get support, you may get failure to support. And the key thing is that they then say there's this next stage, which is how likely is it that that evidence gets into the public domain. And they show very nicely as well that if you combine this with p-hacking, which radically disrupts your alpha level, you can get completely false ideas of area, whole areas of psychology being much, much more, so, or not just psychology, anything, can be much more solid than it actually is. So we have this sort of process where we can inherit bias. So when we read a peer-reviewed paper, we tend to trust the citations that back up a point. We come to write our own paper, we cite the same materials. If you're a good scientist, you won't cite papers without reading them, although many of us... But this won't save you from bias because you'll inherit it because you may not know about these other papers out there because everybody's only citing the same few studies that show you this strong, consistent effect. And I think some of these uh, priming studies that Steve was talking about, for instance, would be of that kind. Um, and you have to explicitly search in order to find other papers that give a different picture. The clinical trials people have been onto this for a long time and now insist that people do what they call a systematic review where you actually have to collect and summarize empirical evidence that you have, you're very strict about the criteria for how you find studies and what your search terms are so that you try and find all the evidence rather than just... Uh, so you're, so you're trying to resist your natural tendency to just select what fits your point of view. But the problem with a systematic review is that it's only as good as the evidence that goes into it. And you can still miss things, even with the best intentions. And here's an example that just came out last week that drove me nuts, um, which I saw through the Science Media Center, had a very good statistical commentary on this paper, which had the title, Solvents in the Workplace and Risk of Autism Spectrum Disorders, concluding that if the parents were exposed to solvents, uh, children were at risk of autism spectrum disorders. Uh, this was a classic case of p-hacking. These authors looked at a lot of things that parents were exposed to, not just solvents, about 10 different things, including things like pesticides. <clears throat> and then they found it was only in mothers and not in fathers and blood. Rather than they, but they only, uh, they focused on the one association that was significant. But the interesting point that I want to stress is that if you were to search the literature on, say, pesticides, 
you wouldn't find this paper because it didn't mention the pesticides in the abstract. It only mentioned the solvents because there it was a significant result. So you, had, you would have evidence that was entirely relevant of a null effect uh, that you would completely miss because it wasn't reported in the title or in the abstract, which is what people search when they do a systematic review. So it's really not good, but it gets worse. <laughs> so I want to move on to... Uh, talk about cognitive schemata uh, and dear old Bartlett. So it seems very appropriate that I should bring in Bartlett and the, his ideas on reconstructive memory. I actually did read Bartlett's book for this lecture, and uh, it's a bit strange. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else has read it. I mean, it's not really got much in the way of rigorous experimentation in it, I have to say. Um, but it has some very interesting ideas. Um, and in particular, the idea that has stuck with people is that remembering is not accurate. We don't just play back what been, we've been presented with when we remember, but we have this reconstruction or construction, as he says, built out of the relation of our attitude towards the whole active mass of organized past reactions or experience and to a little outstanding detail, which commonly appears in image or language form. It's, uh, this is the important bit. It's hardly ever exact, even in the most rudimentary cases of rote recapitulation. And then he says, and it's not at all important that it should be. So the idea is your memory is really very biased and uh, you know, fits in with your prior experiences, but it's not important that it should be accurate um, because the general view is that we would all be completely overwhelmed if we didn't do this, if we didn't use uh, meaning to really guide our perception and our memory. It avoids overload. It allows us to focus on meaning. But, I would argue, it's a two-edged sword, in particularly in the context of scientific reporting. Because um, what is easy to remember is very much what had overlaps with what Richard Dawkins would call a meme. It, uh, ideas that are transmitted from person to person. And Dawkins drew, drew this very nice parallel between how ideas are tr transmitted in communication between people and how genes are transmitted from body to body. But he said, basically, you can think of them as also being affected by natural selection. So there are some ideas that people throw out and just wither away and nobody takes any notice. And there are other ideas that catch on fire and get circulated all over the place. And he says, a good meme is easy to understand, to remember, and to communicate. But the survival does not depend on whether it's useful, true, or potentially harmful. And this explains why some ideas, like vaccination ca uh, causing autism, persist and persist. It's easy to understand and to remember. It's quite emotional and you can communicate it. And the fact that it's actually untrue is very hard then to overcome. And that's the problem that scientists have is that what makes something easy to communicate doesn't necessarily mean it's right. So the problems arise when we become a slave to the power of narrative and more focused on storytelling than reporting the truth. Um, and we are often told that we should tell stories. I mean, all editors and people who are on scientific writing will say to you, if you want to really communicate your ideas, get your work published, you need to tell a good story. The problem is some of the people giving that advice are giving advice that's a bit over the top <clears throat> and suggesting that you should not just tell a good story, but that you should leave out bits that aren't convenient. Dear old Daryl Bem, who we heard about previously in the context of his wonderful work on ESP, um, is famous for writing this article on how you write an empirical journal article. And he says there are two possible articles you can write, the article you plan to write when you designed your study or the article that makes most sense now that you've seen the results. They're rarely the same, and the correct answer is B. Now, this relates back to what we were saying earlier in the previous session about you know, exploratory research and hypothesis testing. The problem is he does not <coughs> say that you... Uh, he doesn't draw that distinction at all. He's very much sort of advising you to p-hack and then to do this harking, hypothesizing after results are known invent a hypothesis to, that makes sense of your data after you've seen it. And indeed, think of your data set as a jewel. Your task is to cut and polish it, to select the facets to highlight, and to craft the best setting for it. A lot of people would say that's really good advice, except that it really is a slippery slope. And one of the reasons that I really took against it is the cover of the book says that it provides invaluable guidance that will help new academics plan, play, and ultimately win the academic career game. Um, Rather than, this book will help you do good science. Um, OK, so I think we have a conflict between how we communicate um, effectively and being comprehensive and accurate. And I think it's a real dilemma to try and get that balance right. 
Because certainly, if we were to just deposit everything that we'd ever done or thought and just sort of stick it out there, it's quite clear that it would not really, and it would be impossible. We would have this mass of results that we couldn't make sense of. But on the other hand, we have to really resist this, temp uh, this temptation to therefore spin our results, hype our results, and make them sound like they're more than they really are. And there's a serious danger, if you follow Bem's advice, that you're going to lead to people being quite... Uh, distorted in how they report things and end up with a picture that where everything looks much more straightforward than it is in reality. And um, Norbert Kerr, who coined the term harking, was really good on this and saying, again, it's not good for the next generation if you do this because other people come along, they read the literature and everything looks cut and dried and neat and tidy and everything, all the hypotheses are beautifully confirmed and so on. When the reality we know is not like that, and people need to be made aware that it's not, rather than pre being presented just with this very sanitized picture. So, last minutes or two, uh, I'll briefly touch on what I think of might be some ways of trying to find a way out of these problems. Um, but I, what I, the main point I want to make is, I've been trying to make here, is that I think some of the problems we have are almost inevitable given that thinking scientifically, I think, is not a natural way to proceed. Uh, and we need special training in how to do it, which sometimes means overcoming rather natural tendencies to do things a different way. So um, I was very interested. I think it was Steve who might have talked about Somebody talked about triangulation. Was it? No, somebody. Anyway, somebody talked about You talked about triangulation, but probably in a slightly different meaning. But um, this is a concept now becoming very popular in epidemiology. Epidemiologists have terrific problems because they can't really do experiments. So they've got all this data, and they're very, very well aware, the good ones, that it's uh, the problems of trying to make causal um, inferences from correlational data. And the best way they can think of going about it is to use multiple approaches to address the question. And they say, you want to really pick different approaches with their own unrelated uh, assumptions, strengths, and weaknesses because you should be looking for those methods that agree across different methodologies. And so Nick was saying that, um, it's coming back to me now, that, that you know, often they don't agree. And that is telling you that there's often a problem with the underlying constructs you're working with. But I think if we tried, when we were running, designing experiments, to try and think of at least two different methods for each experiment, rather than just doing one at a time, we would really be able to perhaps converge more quickly on which theories are more robust and reasonable. Then there's this rather nice idea that I've only tried once, but it comes from business studies, which is a similar idea of just getting people to think in advance about problems rather than diving in and doing a study without really sort of thinking of alternative explanations. Um, the pre-mortem is done in business uh, projects, apparently, uh, and it means sit, getting your project group sitting around a table and you just say, let us imagine that this project we're about to do has failed. Why has it failed? And we did this once with a study, that I, a collaborative study I'm doing in Oxford, where we sat around doing exactly this. And it was very good, because it brought out a lot of people's misgivings about the project and things that could go wrong, but also other ideas for perhaps have it, uh, using additional controls, shoring things up in a way that we would not otherwise have done. So I think that might be just a way of stimulating people to think more um, broadly about how to design something. Then we've had some mention of pre-registration and some different views on it. I'm a huge fan of registered reports and an early adopter. Um, Chris Chambers uh, brought this in in 2014 in Cortex, and other journals are now doing it. The reason I like it is that it has a number of advantages, because if you take classic publishing, where you plan your study, you do your study, you submit it to a journal, then you can go round and round and round this loop, and hopefully eventually you come out of it and publish your paper after it's accepted. What happens with registered reports is you just have the same sequence but in a different order. So the reviewer comments come in at the point when you have a protocol fully uh, identified and hopefully some detailed analytic plan. Um, and in principle, you can get accepted before you've collected the data. And then the main reason for doing this is to overcome these biases, publication bias, low power, p-hacking, and harking. But I've found that an unintended good consequence is that you get your review of feedback at a point when it can be useful. So again, this is another method that actually is encouraging people to think of alternative explanations, alternative controls, and so on, um, before they do their study. Um, and typically, when you've done the study and you get feedback, 
There's bits that one reviewer likes, bits that another reviewer likes, and there's a reviewer who thinks that you should have done something altogether different. This is avoided if you do uh, registered reports. And improving statistical intuitions is one more thing I've already alluded to, using um, simulations so that people actually can see and play with data and test how it uh, changes according to how, whether you've got big or small samples and so on. And we've, we're beginning to try and do a little bit of work in Oxford of developing game-based formats for doing that sort of thing in a less tedious way. And I know other, some other people have already started working in that sort of... I think Richard Morey's also got some ideas for doing that. So just getting people to play with data rather than just presenting them with statistics. So if we go back to the Academy of Medical Sciences, 2015, and their report, they were saying how we needed to change our incentives, we needed better training in methods. I think what I'm arguing is that what's missing from this is that we need to also think about how humans think and reason and find ways to counteract those cognitive biases while we're doing these other things. We need to think about these things with the hat on that, hey, it may be that people are doing this not just because they're ignorant or um, evil, but because it's quite hard to think another way. So thank you for listening, and I have got a much longer and more detailed written version of this which will be available soon. Thank you.